We haven't even seen the back end of January yet, so what makes me so certain that 2015 is going to be a year to remember? In short, it has to be a year to remember. After literally decades of prevarication by our politicians, we now find ourselves pretty much in the last chance saloon with an opportunity during this year for our politicians at long last to get their act together and put sustainable development right at the heart of what we mean by progress, progress for people alive today and progress for all future generations. Three little milestones just to get us going on this. In September, world leaders through the U UN will, I hope, sign up to an initiative called the Sustainable Development Goals. They're the successor initiative to the Millennium Development Goals, which were signed in the year 2000 and have actually delivered quite a lot in terms of improvement in people's lives, addressing poverty, hygiene, health issues, and so on. The SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, is the next development in that whole area, linking people's concerns about the environment, about society, about ecological issues of one kind or another, and governance concerns. Going in the right direction. Then, at the end of the year, as you all know, in Paris, we have the latest in a long line of climate change conferences, where hopefully we will see a new, much more ambitious, possibly even a binding agreement about managing the emission of greenhouse gases and reducing the threat of accelerating climate change. Heading in the right direction. More people are optimistic about that process than they've been for a very long time. Thirdly, here in the UK, we also have a general election on May the 9th, and I'm going to pass over that very quickly <laughs> on the grounds that we need to stay reasonably optimistic this morning. Now, just kind of step aside from this and think about one or two of the principal factors behind this sense of us at last getting close to understanding what living sustainably on this planet really means. Just four numbers for you to think about. You can guess what each of these numbers are as I turn to it. Firstly, that is what the experts tell us the price of oil will be probably throughout 2015 and maybe through the whole of 2016 as well. Certain things going on in Saudi Arabia at the moment that might change that, but by and large, that's the sort of estimate from the experts. Incredible, if you think about it, that this time last year, I'd have had a number up there saying at least $100 a barrel for oil. Secondly, this is the amount that you can expect to be invested in renewable energy during the course of 2015, around $380 billion. That's roughly what we saw in 2014. And we're likely to see at least that much in 2015. And the interesting thing is that this little figure, $45 for a barrel of oil, and this little figure are no longer connected in the way they once used to be. Back in the 1970s, when oil prices spiked, causing dramatic dislocation in the global economy, a huge amount of investment flowed into renewable energy. Well, hey presto, within five to six years, the price of oil came crashing down again, indeed went right, right down to less than $20 a barrel, and most of that renewable effort was written off, just ceased to function. That isn't going to happen this time round, because renewable energy has a momentum of its own. It is no longer dependent on the price of oil or the price of fossil fuels. This big figure, 550 to $750 billion, depending on whose figures you read, is the amount of taxpayers' money that governments spend on fossil fuels every year, subsidizing the very fuels that we're trying to get rid of. The great benefit of a low price of oil is governments might just get brave enough to begin eliminating this incredibly perverse dislocation in our economies. And the UK is one of the worst governments, whatever they may say about being austere in the way they manage our budgets. This is a bit of a dodgy number, obviously. <laughs> Not very helpful. I wish I could give you a firm number here. But this is what is going to happen by the end of this year when we begin to think how much 
we should be charging for every tonne of CO2 that we release into the atmosphere. CO2 being the principal greenhouse gas, the principal source of this phenomenon of accelerating climate change. We don't know what that'll be. It needs to be at least $50 a tonne. It probably needs to go to $200, $250 a tonne. But the great thing is, right now, more and more governments are saying, yes, we need a price on a tonne of carbon. That's incredible. We haven't seen that before. Now, where does this all take us? Well, it takes me into a really extraordinary place. I have been 40 years in the world of sustainable development. I probably feel more confident and hopeful about the prospects for humankind than I've ever felt before. And that is because at long last, the analysis that we've seen over the last 40 years is coming home to roost, and the opportunities to do something about it are getting greater and greater by the year. This is a big claim, or at least a big assertion. And that little word, all, is a very big little word. Because if you think about it, when we talk about all in today's world, this is a big number. This is where we are today. A bit difficult to tell up here, but 2010, we're at 7.2 billion people. And we are heading inexorably to 9 billion people by 2050. Not much we can do about that. Now, you will have noticed that though politicians find it pretty difficult to deal with climate change, they find it literally impossible to address the challenge of continuing population growth. And yet these two things are inextricably linked, inextricably linked. The numbers of people on the planet and the amount of greenhouse gases we emit into the atmosphere. Obviously, they go hand in hand. The more people there are on the planet, the more we emit by way of these greenhouse gases. But we don't address these two things at the same time. Indeed, we're lucky if we address this one at all. And yet, this is the simple message that everybody now needs to understand, that the future of humankind and the prospects for a brilliant, genuinely sustainable way of life for 9 billion people depend on that. Radical decarbonisation, which means literally getting all the carbon-based fuels, the coal, the oil, the gas, out of the economy as fast as we possibly can to ensure that we stay the right side of that hoped-for stable climate in the future. I doubt you'll hear one of our mainstream political parties talk about the need for radical decarbonisation before May the 9th. I can guarantee you won't hear it from UKIP, and I can guarantee that you will hear it from the Green Party. You make your own mind up about that. This is a tough call, though. And this is my only sort of really geeky little slide I just want to share with you today. I know this is based on research, however, done by WWF. So let's have no knocking around this. And isn't it great, by the way, to be in a building that is all about radical decarbonization, which is what this building, the Living Planet Center, is all about? And isn't it be great to be doing this in a town that is focused on what real decarbonization means? Brilliant here to share this event with Ray. OK, very simply explained, here we are today, caught in a world of oil, gas, coal, a bit of nuclear, not very relevant, to be honest, <laughs> utterly irrelevant over here, and some bioenergy renewables down here. That's roughly where we are, and you can see that energy consumption continues to increase for the next few years. It's inevitable. Countries are getting richer, they need more energy. And this is the nature of the transformation that we have to achieve by 2050. Today is all about transformation. This is the biggest transformation in every single human being's life over the course of the next 30 to 35 years. The biggest single transformation. Out of fossil fuels, which cause these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and into a whole array of different renewables. Biofuels, biogas, biomass, hydropower, geothermal, solar, wind, wave, and tidal. Perfectly doable, technologically. No barrier to doing it whatsoever from a technology point of view. But guess what? There's a lot of money in these guys. A lot of power, a lot of vested interests, a lot of corruption, and many, many barriers to making that transformation in the way that we need to do. But it is, of course, the case that this solar bit here 
is the bit that should probably give you most hope for this idea of a genuinely sustainable, just, sustainable economy for everybody. We're getting used to it now. You probably wouldn't find that in the UK. You can probably guess where this is. Denmark, you know. Usual suspect territory when it comes to right on <laughs> renewable technology. Brilliant stuff. Love it. It's fantastic. This is beginning to happen all over the place. You can probably guess how important this is in Africa. Distributed, local, photovoltaics, ground mounted on the ground. It doesn't impede any of the agriculture they need to do. Growing unbelievably fast through Africa and other developing and emerging countries. Unbelievably fast. And what we're beginning to see is that these two very simple approaches to solar energy, photovoltaics, is growing all the time. And it's getting cheaper all the time. It's getting more efficient all the time. This is an unbeatable combination. Literally, the, the price comes down by 6 to 7% every year, and efficiencies increase by somewhere between about 1% and 2% every year. This is dramatic. This is changing the whole nature of the global energy economy. And waiting in the wings, we have a different kind of solar technology. This is called concentrated solar power. Captures the incoming rays of the sun. Concentrates that energy onto this pipe here, which is full of oil, which is heated up to an extremely high temperature, which goes around to a pretty conventional turbine, which produces steam, which drives the turbine, which produces electricity. That's me. There. We could only stand there <laughs> for about 30 seconds. It was so hot, we had to move out of the way. That is in Abu Dhabi, improbable champion of all things renewable, but trust me, it is. And that's the biggest concentrated solar power plant in the world today, 100 megawatts. By the end of next year, that will be small beer. That will be small beer. We're beginning to see incredible investments all over the place. Now, why am I banging on about solar? It's only one technology, or one family of technologies. But think about the cascade here. If we need to transform the lives of 9 billion people by 2050, we have to transform our economy. To transform our economy, we have to change the energy system on which that economy depends. And to transform the energy system, we have to be able to rely on revolutions, technology revolutions of this kind. And that is what is happening. I've put this out as a challenge to anyone in the TED network. Is this the most boring slide ever shown during any TED talk anywhere in the world? I think it probably is. I want that accolade. <laughs> Please tweet if you feel that's appropriate. But look, solar on its own, renewable energy on its own can't do it. As the Daily Mail so helpfully reminds us from time to time, the sun does not shine for 24 hours a day. They're smart at the Daily Mail. <laughs> the wind doesn't blow for 24 hours a day, unless you live in the Orkneys or Shetland, wherever it might be. So we have to be able to store this stuff. The brilliant news now is billions of dollars of new investment is going into storage technologies of one kind or another. And this is rapidly making the whole prospect of a renewable energy revolution look extremely feasible. Here it is. This is what the energy revolution, or if you like, the energy internet of the future depends upon. Efficiency first, because frankly, without efficiency, we won't be able to do all the rest. We know efficiency is difficult, but you talk to anyone about this building, you talk to a lot of people in Woking, you'll find out what energy efficiency is all about. Put it first, because it really matters. And don't forget, we do know how to do this. Since the year 2000, GDP in the UK has increased by 18%. Not bad. Not as good as some people might like, but not bad. During that time, total energy consumption has reduced by 14%. So 18% increase in GDP, 14% reduction in total energy consumption. That is called decoupling. And we need to do this decoupling even faster and more dramatically than we've done it up until now. But this is pretty amazing what's happening here. Efficiency, renewable storage, and then smart grids coming in off the back of that to get all those more efficient, cleaner electrons to the places where they're really needed. This is happening. And the people call it the energy internet because there's this analogy with 
how we've used information, how we've seen the Internet of Information develop, and just think about what that would mean in an energy system. But of course, what is happening now is this what I call the innovation pipeline. New ideas about water, about materials, about waste, about manufacturing, about health, about agriculture, forestry, you name it. This innovation pipeline is literally bulging with new ideas, with breakthrough promise for a better world. We just need the political systems which will allow these innovations to emerge at pace, at scale, to make the difference that people are crying out for all over the world. So it's not a problem about technology that we face. It isn't to do with a lack of money. Actually, the world is awash with money to invest in these alternative futures. But we have a bit of a problem. You would be properly critical of me if I finished a talk like this by saying that all we need is technology breakthroughs. So you can all relax, leave it up to the engineers, the smart kids, to get all this stuff working. There are lots of people who do believe that. They call themselves the cornucopians. And they're out there saying, technology is the answer to every problem we face. Absolutely not so. We cannot do what we need to do without technology. It's simply not possible. But that's just the start. And then you have to layer in these, in some respects, even more critical ingredients of what sustainability is all about. We have to create a world in which our mindsets are changing, to embrace the lives of other people, to put ourselves in the shoes of other people, understand what their lives look like, not just in the rich world countries we know reasonably well, but in developing and emerging countries around the world. We have to have a capacity for empathy. We have to feel what it looks like to be part of one shared common destiny, part of a proper human family. And then the last bit, trust me, of course, is the equity story. There is no sustainability without social justice. There are lots of people who don't want to acknowledge that, and lots of people that it's just about the natural environment and all the rest of it. It isn't. It has to be as much about social justice as it is about biophysical sustainability and how we make the economy work. That's a powerful combination. We're beginning to see the technology side come right. We've got to do a huge amount of work on the empathy and equity story. But 2015 is the year it all kicks off. Thank you. Thank you.